Um, so, our next speaker um, is Peter Cronier, and he does amazingly interesting work. He's a, a, a human rights lawyer, and he works as a consultant for police forces up and down Africa, covering all sorts of topics like human trafficking and things like that. So, in order to keep himself sane, he, he uh, does a lot of phoning, <laughs> phoning in Africa, and he's going to tell us more about that this evening. So, thank you, Peter. <laughs> Jou beer. As, as was explained, I'm a human rights lawyer, and I'm very fortunate because I go to, to places where normal people don't go, like the Sierra Leone's and, and the... Um, the Somalias and uh, you know places like Iraq and things like that. So I was quite fortunate um, uh, many years ago. Um, a good friend of mine, Leslie Frescura, and I actually went to Papua New Guinea, and then um, we had a long chat. And she said to me, Peter, why don't you, with your personality being a little compulsive and a little you know, try you know, why don't you you start collecting stuff for the animal demography unit. So I actually started and then um, I actually saw that at that stage the phone part didn't have a lot of um, photographs. So I started to do phoning and um, I started to know Dieter in this whole process. So um, at that stage um, I realized that there was quite a lot of white, uh, uh, quite a lot of southern mask weavers here in Pretoria. So at that stage, my daughter was still in matric, and um, I started doing collection of uh, white browed sparrow weavers, and this is the area around my house towards Waterkloof High School. So every morning I dropped off my daughter from school, I actually took another road back to my house, and I actually took photographs until my wife actually found out why I always took an extra hour in the mornings to um, to, to get back to the house. So um, that was quite an exciting process. Um, so you could see this, this was quite an extensive collection of photographs in, in Pretoria East. So that's how I basically started off in, in, the, in the whole process. And also another reason why I started using phone is that at that stage phone was not only linked to South Africa. And as I'm working all over the world, um, there's a lot of places where I can actually watch and take photographs of weaver nests. So um, there was a few crazy things that happened to me. Um, oh, uh, this, this, this is also something that I do. I ask my wife to drive and then I actually take photographs of weaver nests while I'm driving. So this is, as you can see, the road from Harry Smith um, to Balfour and from Bloemfontein to Kroenstadt and I mean all over South Africa, I actually um, took photographs, and these are all white brown sparrow weaver, ach, not white brown southern wasp weaver nests. So, um, uh, I, I'm, as you can say, I'm a little compulsive, and I was really going in this process until my daughters started uh, reprimanding me. Um, this was actually in um, KwaZulu Natal because we got a place in Mtloti. So um, at this stage, I actually know every weaver nest in the whole uh, of the area around Umtloti. So um, that happens over weekends when my family is still sleeping in the mornings, I get into my car and I, <laughs> I take my map and I actually drive every little road um, around the area where I have my holiday place. So that's what happened in South Africa. I was quite fortunate um, to work in Mauritius and um, they, my dear friend Les actually introduced me to, to some people and they actually helped me to go and see the uh, Mauritius Fodi, which was quite an exciting thing. I was quite fortunate and um, they took me to a little island, which is a reserve, where there was a lot of students um, doing research, but that was quite a highlight in my, my phoning process. Um, uh, after I worked in Mauritius, I actually took an extra day um, because uh, the uh, village weaver was actually introduced into Mauritius and it actually it actually started um, you know making nests all over the island 
And I actually worked here in this area. So I actually rented a car um, and then a car with a driver because it's very difficult to take photographs while you're driving. So I actually drove around the island all the way to the airport and I actually managed to take quite a lot of photos of, of village weavers in Mauritius. Um, so um, this was just the story of the, of the village weaver, how it was introduced in 1886 um, because I, I did a little bit of research and um, unfortunately um, they're causing a little bit of havoc um, and at one stage they tried to kill off um, some of the village weavers uh, I'm not, I don't I don't know what what is happening at the moment with them, but that was quite an exciting situation as well. Um, as I said, while I was there, I also managed to see the the white eye, the Mauritius white eye, the Mauritius pink pigeon, and uh, the, there's a Mauritius tortoise. So that was quite an exciting thing that the phoning actually helped me to see other things in nature as well. And as a lawyer, to start knowing about nature and learning about all this stuff. Um, then I actually worked in Seychelles. I was doing some tra training on human trafficking for um, law enforcement officers. But unfortunately there I didn't have a car. So um, during lunch breaks and during tea breaks, I actually just walked um, along the streets around the police college and I managed to actually collect quite a few photographs of the Mad Madagascar phony, which is quite common in, in Seychelles. Um, after our workshop, the police actually um, um, put me on an aeroplane and they, they said that I could stay uh, uh, an extra night in Pralin. And there also you could see that the, the police guest house was around this area and I actually walked all the way there and um, then I took the ferry all over to Ladik and then in Ladik I actually managed to rent a little bicycle so I could, I could move a little easier. So I actually managed to plot quite a few birds in Pralin and Ladik as well, but mostly Madagascar phonies. I couldn't see the Seychelles phony because they are mostly situated on a very small island somewhere. Um, I also worked in Angola and doing training on violence against women and children, which was quite an interesting process. And then I heard about the new game reserve. Actually, it was an old game reserve and the, um, the South Africans actually stopped the game reserve. Uh, there was a professor at the University of Pretoria and they called it Operation Noah's Ark or something like that. And where they brought a lot of animals from all over Africa towards this um, towards this game reserve. But what was fascinating to me was all these big baobab trees next to the beach. So I actually went to that, um, to that game reserve and I managed to, to photograph quite a lot of buffalo weaver on my trip. So that was quite exciting as well. Um, this was a crazy story. I actually was working on Bangladesh to train the people on human rights for, before the elections. So um, my friend Andre Redman, who is a South African, he invited me there and then we drove up to the northern part of Bangladesh and we ended up on the border of Bangladesh and, um, and India. But there I was looking for the bio weaver, which was quite common apparently in the whole of the subcontinent. And um, as we drove, um, I, we actually stopped um, at, at each little village asking the people you know, have you seen the Babu El Paki? Because that is the name for the bar, bar, for the bio weaver. And as I was doing my lecture um, or presentation to the group of students, my last pictures on my PowerPoint presentation was a picture of the Babu El Paki, the, 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 the bio weaver. And I actually asked the students if they actually saw any bio weavers in their lives, you know. So, uh, it was quite amazing and they told me when they were young boys they used to have bio weavers in their villages and because there's a, a certain kind of palm that grows um, in, in, in Bangladesh because Bangladesh is actually in a delta so half of Bangladesh is underwater so most of the villages are actually rice paddies um, in, in, this, in this area and there's a lot of these palm trees and um, even when I spoke to people at the villages, they told me that there used to be a lot of these um, nests. But you know, as as I, you know, as the years went by, they stopped um, they stopped nesting there. 
And then I, I, I mean, I'm just a lay person, but I asked them, do they use agricultural chemicals in the, in the, you know, planting the, their rice and things like that. So it actually, I, I mean, even me as a, as a lay person um, could actually deduce that um, the use of agricultural chemicals are actually killing off a lot of, of the food um, source of some of the, of some of the, of the weavers. So, um, that was quite a sad situation. The same happened when I was working in India, but there at least I managed to see a few more bio weavers. A very sad situation is I actually worked in um, Cambodia and they are Buddhist. So one of their little things that they do is they catch these birds and then you have to pay to release the birds. And it seemed to me that the most common bird that they are using there were the bio weaver. And I, this is in, in, in Phnom Penh on the Mekong River. There's a, a small Buddhist temple and especially for tourists, they love to come there. And I was really shocked to see these cages with hundreds and thousands of bio weavers. And then when I asked them where they actually caught the, the bio weavers, they said they, they catch them in the villages and then they bring them to Phnom Penh because it's a huge, it's a huge way for them to, to earn money. And, you know, so because, um, well, the locals, but a lot of tourists, they like to, to, to buy the, this little bird. But the sad thing is you could see them releasing this bird and then these young boys run after the birds and then they catch them again. So um, they're actually taking all these birds out of, out of the, the whole ecosystem, which made me really, really sad. Um, I was also quite fortunate um, to work in Kenya for quite a few, um, well, if, if you count all the months that I worked there, it added up to about two years um, doing a prison project. And um, we actually visited some of the most amazing parts of the country. And it was just fascinating um, to see all these weaver nests. I mean, um, really crazy kind of weavers. Um, and everywhere you go, you could see them, you know, especially the Bachafek weavers. And I mean, there was some really amazing, amazing stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I was quite fortunate um, in Kenya as well, um, doing the driving thing because, you know, as, as we work in specific towns, um, that we were always driven there. And I, I, sort of, I sort of worked this thing. I've got a really nice long lens on my camera and then I've got a, um, a GPS thing on my phone. So I put my GPS, uh, I put my phone in the corner and then we drive and I take the photograph and then I take the GPS photograph GPS photograph GPS and you could see this is a, like a round trip um, all the way from Nairobi which is approximately here down to the Oti River and then we were doing training here in Yanuki and um, so it was just quite incredible to work in these countries and to have this this opportunity to take all the photographs of the weavers. Um, yeah, I actually we, we I actually worked in um, near Lake Naivasha, um, and I managed to take photographs of the white proud sparrow weavers. Um, so that was quite interesting. Uh, also, what was interesting um, around Nairobi, they've got this little um, spider's web, um, and they everywhere you see these white proud sparrow weavers, you see these these little spiders. It's like, it, it looks like a colony spider. I'm not sure what kind of spider it was, but that was quite fascinating to see all these spiders around the nests. You could see here around the nests of the white proud sparrow weavers. Uh, oh, so here was Lake Naivasha where I actually saw a lot of red-headed um, weavers um, and that was also quite fascinating. Unfortunately, I didn't have a car to drive around. So in the afternoons, I actually got a bicycle from the hotel and my camera and I just explored the area. So that was quite fascinating. Um, what was quite interesting, I saw a little vervet monkey raiding the uh, uh, Bachlafek weaver nest and eating the, 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 the eggs. And it's just fascinating when, when you start looking at stuff, how other things happen. Um, then, you know, around this, um, although I, I, I used to focus mostly on, on, um, on the phone, um, I managed to, to see other things as well. Um, um, 
looking at frogs and, and dragonflies is also quite fascinating to me. But in places like Sierra Leone, I managed to visit a, a chimp um, sanctuary and there we saw lots and lots of butterflies. Something that really, really saddens me is the, the bush trade, especially in West Africa, in places like Ghana, where people stand next to the road and you see all these little dick dicks and all these little animals. At that stage, I actually phoned the uh, people from the, uh, who was doing the mammal mapping and they um, explained to me that um, I should also take photographs of the dead animals that are sold um, as bushmeat because that would give them an indication of the, of the distribution as well. So basically, um, I, I, I'm doing a lot of phoning, but I also like to take photographs of, of butterflies and I was really happy because when I was in Somalia I actually took a, a photograph of a butterfly which have never been photographed before and which was recorded in the 1800s by some Italian le lepidopterist and that was quite fascinating when I posted that, that, um, that photograph uh, I was immediately contacted and that was quite fascinating as well. So that's basically my little story. Yo, th thank you, Peter. <laughs> that's that's really amazing, and uh, we are so grateful for your amazing yeah. dedication <laughs> to to map so many weaver nests. Yeah. It's, Where it's am incredible. I now? I'm like a. I've got quite a few thousand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a little and what is quite fascinating, I mean, at one stage I was working in Cambodia. And I asked the police, you know, and, um, and about two weeks later, I got this photograph of this guy and he went back to his village and he took a photograph with his cell phone and he sent me the GPS coordinates. Same happened in Bangladesh as well. One guy that was in that big group, he actually, uh, he was fascinated. And then he sent me a photograph from a one, one um, you know, one set of nests in, in his village. So uh, Amazing. Yeah. So you're actually helping to to spread the, oh, the yes, yes yeah. the love of citizen science. So well done. <laughs> and I'm a little crazy because I always ask the people, what do you do with all these photographs that you're taking? And then they say, it's no, it's only for myself. And then I start telling them, but there is actually a place where you can put the photographs and you can create your own virtual museum. And <laughs> then all these researchers are going to use, I mean, like Craig said tonight, you know, you can use all these photographs that, that people like I um, put on the ADU to, to help with his research. So, um, so sometimes you have to nudge these people. And then when you see them again, they said, oh, I actually opened a, you know, a, a little thing and I actually started posting my photographs. So, so then they are quite excited about this. But yeah. you actually have to work really hard to speak to people and you know tell them about this so. yes but 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 thank you i mean it's 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 people like you that, that because you, you're so enthusiastic about it and that enthusiasm rubs off on yeah. on other people and um it really gets them into it and just shows like once you get into this wonderful world of of mapping biodiversity it's 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 quite addictive <laughs> But the sad thing is most of the coppers that I work with thinks I'm a crazy Misungu from Africa, you know, from South Africa, you know, the crazy white man, you know, always walking with my, with my camera. And I've been locked up a few, uh, I've nearly been locked up a few times, like in Somalia, all of a sudden there were 14 guys with AKs around me and they were asking me why I'm taking photographs next to a military installation, you know, and there was a, there was a little butterfly that I wanted to take of the photograph of, so um, I had to, I had to phone the big general to, uh, to explain to them because they couldn't speak English. So uh, I've had a few very close shaves, you know, but I mean, at least I'm having fun. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, thank you. It also goes to say that citizen science is also very, very adventure packed. That's for sure. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think maybe we have time for one question. If anybody has, has a question that would like to ask. Uh, I'm trying to see in the comments if maybe there's one. I know somebody posted a photo. Oh wait, 
Um, oh, so so Craig asked, um, how do you sync GPS with your camera? Um, he says he does tons of drive by photography. There's there's actually quite a nice little app. Um, let me show you. It's called um, G My GPS Coordinates. So it, it, it shows like, uh, uh, let me just take this away. Uh, I do not know if you would be able to see it, but it shows very big the GPS coordinates. So wherever you move, this thing shows your GPS coordinates. And if I put it in the corner of my car, because if you approach a tree, for example, um, even if you're driving um, and you, you take the photograph of the, of the nest, as you get under the tree, then you take the photograph of the, of, of the GPS, but also when you place your stuff on the on the um, on the ADU website, there is actually a, um, uh, there's actually a map, and there's a map with with a real picture on it. So you can physically go to that specific tree on the map. So when I when I put my photograph on it and I go into the map. I can physically go to that specific tree because if you go and zoom in, that actually shows that specific tree where you where you actually took the photograph. And I mean, it's much easier when you when you're doing lip lip mapping or a dragonfly or whatever because then you're standing still and you can you can map the, the, the you can you can map it. You know, so that's how I basically awesome. do it. And um, just give the name again of that app you were using. Um, it's called My GPS my gps coordinates or something like that my daughter actually found it um um yeah it, it's uh, it's a little yeah I, I'm, it's it's let me just see it's it's my gps coordinates or something like that you know okay. it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's um, quite very very quickly um at at the start of lockdown my beautiful camera with a built-in gps was stolen oh, so yeah. i've had to come up with with an alternative plan yeah. This is and I found this, this amazing thing called um, GeoSetter. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make a video. I've been meaning to do it because you, you record a, a track yeah. and then this thing matches up the time of your camera and the time of the GPS and puts the coordinates onto your, onto your photo. And it's just amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That sounds very cool. Sometimes you have to be creative. Before this, I actually had my, um, my what do you call it, my Garmin uh, in, in the car. And then I would just take a photo, take a photo of my Garmin, you know. The, yeah. So, I mean, but normally the people who are driving with me think that I'm totally, totally crazy. I, I was um, on my way to the Taj Mahal. I was working in New Delhi. And then all of a sudden I shouted, stop, stop, stop. And I got out of the car because I saw some um, bio weavers um, nesting far away side a long lens and this guy from the uk said are you effing crazy i mean why why you know so i mean you get those kind of questions as well you know but <laughs> it's all it's all in the name of science that's fine <laughs>